Hello, this is David Sloan Wilson for This View of Life, the online evolution magazine. And I'm here with Gabriel Principe. Hello. And uh, John Sweller, all the way from the University of New South Wales. Hello, John. How are you? And uh, we're here at the uh, Evolution Institute uh, workshop on evolutionary perspectives on educational research policy and uh, practice. And uh, John, you are the second speaker. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about um, um, what you told us, what you told us in your in your talk, and uh, more generally about uh, um, evolution or education from an evolutionary perspective. I've uh, I've used evolutionary theory for several years now as a uh, base, as a theoretical base for cognitive load theory. Now, cognitive load theory is a uh, instructional theory that makes use of our knowledge of human cognitive architecture. And I've suggested that we can best analyze human cognitive architecture via a Darwinian evolutionary approach. So, first I try to distinguish between categories of knowledge and I use the work of David Geary very, very heavily in that respect. I think his distinction between biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge has the potential to change the field of instructional design. In fact, it's more than potential. I think it's in the process of changing instructional design right now. We can easily see, in a way which we couldn't see previously, that some human activities, some categories of uh, learning can occur easily, effortlessly, uh, virtually unconsciously and they're biologically primary. And those types of learning, that type of learning or learning that acquiring that type of knowledge doesn't need it doesn't require teaching. It doesn't require instruction of any sort. A lot of that material can be described as a generic skill. Generic skills are extremely important. Students have to learn them, but you can't teach them. And you can't teach them because they've already been learned. If something's been learned, and if it's something's been learned well, then we simply waste our time attempting to teach that sort of skill. In contrast, the sorts of material that are that, that is taught in schools is biologically secondary and biologically secondary knowledge is knowledge which we can acquire and which we need to acquire for cultural reasons but which won't be acquired easily or automatically it can be difficult to acquire, it requires conscious effort, it requires a lot of work. And we invented schools precisely because our culture now requires a lot of that sort of knowledge. Until about 1, 150, 200 years ago, the cultures that existed in those times did not require that sort of knowledge to any great degree. Some people required that knowledge, but most people didn't. They could live perfectly adequate lives without that sort of biologically secondary knowledge. That's no longer the case. In advanced industrial societies, most people need to know lots and lots of things, even things which we consider fairly basic like reading and writing which they didn't need to know in previous generations and which are biologically secondary, need to be taught, need to be taught explicitly, 
and directly because if they're not taught explicitly and directly, students will tend not to learn them at all. So the first point I want to, first collection of points that I want to make is that we as educators are concerned with biologically secondary knowledge and biologically secondary knowledge has a certain set of characteristics that require it to be taught in a certain way. And the second collection of points I want to make is that when you look at the cognitive architecture that's associated with biologically secondary knowledge, that architecture is um, very, very similar to the functions and procedures associated with evolution by natural selection. In other words, both human cognitive architecture when dealing with biologically secondary knowledge and evolution by natural selection use the same processes. And we can describe those processes. And when one describes those processes, one can see the close analogy between evolution by natural selection and human cognitive architecture. And because we know a lot more about evolutionary biology than we know about human cognitive architecture, we can use the analogy to tell us things about human cognitive architecture which are useful and in turn we can use those those things to design instruction and essentially that's the procedure that's the research um, that's the research area that I work in great um, I'm interested in hearing about why you think schools are necessary to transmit or facilitate the development of, of, of biologically secondary skills. If there's skills that are important for successful life in a culture, why wouldn't those things or why couldn't those things emerge naturally? One of the, I guess in a sense, peculiarities of schools is that they organize material in a fashion which is not natural but which is desirable from the point of view of intelligibility understanding if if you want to understand for example the physics associated with light you simply are not going to learn that physics by going outside and looking at light. We've been doing that since for millennia and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't teach you a great deal about light. What you have to do is in effect teach about light in a way that is very artificial it's the only way to understand the physics of light. In a way, interestingly, biological evolution provides another example. You really are not going to learn biological evolution by going outside and just looking at the world. Darwin could do it that way. Most people can't. You really need to go into the artificial environment of a classroom where you're taught the various aspects of biological evolution, how they go together, how they work. Then you can understand it. But that requires somebody to, to tell you about 
biological evolution. You're not going to simply pick it up by mixing with biologists. That's not going to be sufficient unless those biologists are busily telling you exactly what Darwinian evolution means. And similarly, you're not going to learn the physics of light or the or, uh, uh, chemistry simply by mixing with the right sort of people. Mm -hmm. You need direct, explicit instruction which tells you about things and which tells you what they mean, how you use them, how you solve problems using that material. And we've got endless experiments which demonstrate precisely that. We run randomised controlled experiments in which, for example, we compare people who are explicitly presented information as opposed to people who simply attempt to solve problems without the explicit presentation of material. And the results are unambiguous. These results have been replicated time and time again. You learn more if somebody tells you something, providing they tell it to you in an appropriate fashion. It's always possible to tell somebody something in a way which is utterly unintelligible. But if it's properly presented, you'll learn more rapidly. So we have a final question that we're asking all of the participants. It is this. What is the added value of approaching education from an evolutionary perspective? It, it provides, in my case, it provides a structure that's already been worked out a structure which tells us how we should organize information, how we should think about human cognitive architecture, and as a consequence of knowing how to organize information, how, to, how human cognitive architecture functions, we can design instructional materials which make sense based on that theoretical base. Without that sort of theoretical base, we can easily design instruction, but it's random. It's likely to be random in its effectiveness, and we won't know, okay, this instructional procedure is effective, this other one isn't. Why? We'll have no idea why. By using that theoretical base, Firstly, it allows us to generate instructional procedures, but secondly, it explains to us if a particular instructional procedure works and another one doesn't, it tells us why. It provides a theoretical base. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks much. <laughs>